welcome, welcome, welcome to the Melanate Perspective. I'm your host, J.R. King. I'm here with Pastor Jamal Francois. What's going on, everybody? How you doing today, brother? I'm doing well, man. Bless me. That's right, that's right. We're going to jump right into it. We off the dome. We don't have anything planned for this conversation. I'm All right. This, I met this brother a couple weeks ago. I actually met his mom. That's right. I met his mom at SNS, SNS Cafe. I ran the tour. We had a good conversation about 30 minutes. She passed my information on to her son, and we've been chopping it up ever since. That's right. That's right. So what I've learned is you're a pastor, but you're also a rapper. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's very unique. I listen to your music, and I love it, man. I, I appreciate love it. it. I love your energy. <clears throat> um, let's start off with how did you become a pastor, and who were you before becoming a pastor? So, uh, I went under the LA's double A because my name is Jamal J A M double A L. Okay, and uh, I started rapping seriously professionally. I would say uh, 2008, God gave me a vision. I had overdosed on syrup, I was at uh, Georgia Southern partying. Prior to that, I was asking God, What is my purpose? What, you, what would you have me do on this earth? Mm -hmm. I had already been rapping mixtapes all throughout high school. Um, I had a near-death experience. A guy actually told me that I was going to die. And um, I was like, Lord, I don't want to die. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, you know, and in that moment, um, God gave me a vision that I was going to be a rap superstar and lead people to Jesus. Right. But not do it in a religious way. Like, be me and reach the unchurched, reach people in the streets, reach okay. people in the suburbs that way. Um, so I went under that LHAA. About two months, maybe one and a half months after that, I won mm -hmm. Best New Artist in the CSRA Hip Hop and R&B Awards. Okay. And then my label, PCP, won Best Indie Label. Now, I was 19 years old, you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, coming up in the air, I don't know if you know any of the names back in the day from Augusta, but, you know, it was some names out there, and I was just like, wow, I was blessed to win this, you know, like a month and a half after I got this vision. Right. And uh, we just hit the ground running from there, you know, Power Fest, May Fest, um, all the radio stations in the CSRA, mm -hmm. um, got played on the station in Atlanta, ended up charting um, nationally with my song Jazzy, produced by Big Nick. Okay. And uh, that's my background with rap. Went out to L.A., homeless, sleeping outside of Def Jam, um, met the VP of Island Def Jam, freestyled for him in Atlanta. Met, ran into him again in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. um, ended up getting an indie deal, but ended up turning it down. All right. It didn't, you know, it just didn't feel right. And then uh, about a month after I turned down that record deal, I met my pastor. Um, I, I hit up my homie. I was going to buy some weed. And <laughs> I bought some weed and watched this. So I, I bought weed, but my right. gas tank was on E. So I had money to buy weed, no, been there, but I ain't... <laughs> So yeah, my homie, and, and the homie is Flock, DJ Flock, 97.9 The Wiz. He is the guy that, uh, he uh, invited me to All About Change. So he was like, hey, Dub, you know, your car on E. I invited you to the church, you know, just ride with me. And I was like, okay, I'll ride with you. Mm -hmm. um, visited the church, <clears throat> it was in the house, and never stopped going eight years later, you know. Okay, well, you touched on L.A. Mm -hmm. kind of spoke about that a few days ago when we first met. Yeah. Just tell the people about your experience. Testimony, man. Me and my wife was like, we going to L.A. We gonna meet Kanye West. You know what I'm saying? We gonna mm -hmm. because I think he's one of the most um, most similar people in the music and entertainment industry to me and how I think. Just seeing his come up, right. how he um, merges his faith with his music. Um, super right. confident, um, super honest. Mm -hmm. um, we all get crazy and rant sometimes. We do. Um, his is just caught on camera oh, and wow. um, you know we went out there trying to find good music and the address I had is what led us to Def Jam mm -hmm. um, we never found good music though I don't know if it was an old address or what but um, we went off of faith like I remember reading something that said get in touch with the person that um, is doing what you want to do mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's what we tried to do. So we took a one-way. My dad bought me, my wife, and our friend one-way tickets to L.A. Under the premise, under the what he thought we had, hotels 
and everything. So we had a hundred dollars in faith. That's it. Between three of y'all. Yeah. And when we touched down in LAX, we slept in the airport the first night because the all the hotels around were, were booked up. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean just crazy faith and you know, but God always provided, like we never missed a meal. Whether I found uh you remember when McDonald's was doing the monopoly thing? I do. So and you get win free <laughs> food, yeah. burgers and fries. So we would always find that. I found a meal voucher one day. Even to the point of like going to shelters and, and getting clothes and food, like I experienced all of that. Has to be a hell of an experience, man. I never experienced anything like it. Yeah. But coming from that, how do you have the strength to get where you are now? You know, going through that right there. You know, that's a hell of a thing to go through at the time. It is a hell of a you thing to go through. And it's still, were you religious at that point? Did you believe like you believe now? Or did it something happen to kind of lead to this? Um, yeah, of course I believe because I wouldn't have even went and did that if I if I didn't believe that something great was going to come out of it, even if it was to strengthen my faith. And then I, because my whole thing was I wanted to get a record deal by the time I was 24, and I did. You know, when I did that, I was 23. I had got married at 22, turned 23, and I had did everything that a local artist in Augusta could dream of. Okay. You know, I won the awards. I did all the biggest shows, everything. I had did everything except perform at the James Round Arena. Okay. And then I did that this year on the outside. We went inside. We was on the outside of it with Waka Flocka and Lil Duval and Ro Timmy. But um, I was just at the point where there was nothing left for me to do in Augusta, like, I had did the newspapers, the radio stations, all these clubs and stuff, you know, Cream, Sultry Sounds, mm -hmm. um, 1102, all of that stuff, you know, shout out to Kid Joe Sly, Tay Chills, these are all DJs that have played my music that I built relationships with over time, Flocko, um, even helping Flock win to be a radio personality on Fox 103, like we was, I was in the running with him and then he um, went to the next level, and I did it, and I was just like, well, I'll help you out. And then he won. And me not winning was a blessing because after he won, he helped get my song Jazzy um, in rotation at the station. So it's like after that, it was like, okay, you local, you becoming regional, but I want to be global. And right. that's why I went to L.A. because that's where Hollywood is. Yeah, I heard a lot of stories about people running to L.A. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a lot of it ends way worse, you know. Yeah. So how long has it been since you've been back in Augusta? Man, that was back in 2012. Okay. So we came back here pretty much like 2013 because I had a notion that my wife was pregnant. And I was like, um, we had got the deal and the guy was like, just head back home. And then, you know, we'll get everything straightened out and fly, I'll fly you back out here and everything. And the day we came back to Augusta, we went to MCG, um, and my wife got a pregnancy test, and she was pregnant, and that was um, that was like leading up into 2013. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have um, I have a couple times in my life where I've been told I was supposed to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. um, I remember you I can, telling me. That. I can remember one time I shared with you guys. We was at Golden Corral, my wife and I. We had went with uh. <clears throat> It was a pastor from the job. Him and his wife took my wife and I out. And I remember this lady staring at me. So you remember Golden Corral on Sundays was always packed. That's right. So it's Sunday. The big crowd is there. And this lady, she's like an hour at me. I'm thinking, my head, oh, hell. The hell I'd have done to this lady. So she stands up and starts walking over to her. And when she gets there, she starts crying. She tells me that I was supposed to change lives. And I was supposed to be a pastor and all that mm. stuff. I just wanted her to get the hell out of my face. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was embarrassed. Yeah. I'm like, man. You trying to eat. So yeah. it happened like that a couple more times. But I never could. With see different myself. people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Different people. One, I was a pastor. And two, of them happened in different restaurants. And um, I just couldn't see myself going down that road. You know, I was into a different life. And I honestly still can't see myself being a preacher. Mm -hmm. But I'm working with a life coach now. And okay. he's teaching me that um, it's really no different. The yeah. preacher is just a teacher. You know, right. it's all about how you're looking at it. So he's getting me to try to walk into that light now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Walk into that light now and just understand, as long as I'm trying to affect lives, you know what I'm saying? I don't have to put a label on it. And that's kind of how I am with it now. Yeah. Um, 
one of the things I want to touch on with you, we had a conversation I thought was real dope. I never been able to have a conversation with the pastor. Mm -hmm. You know, I told you that I don't really believe exactly what you believe. Mm -hmm. I believe in God 100%, mm -hmm. but I don't believe in religion. Yeah. And that's kind of what made me think you was pretty dope because I was able to have that conversation without you feeling no kind of way and without me feeling no kind of way. Yeah. So I want to actually have a conversation like that if we could. Um, so I don't want to, the way I look at it, I look at it like all religion kind of teaches the same thing. I never really studied one like I should have, but I did and dab dibble and dabble in each one of them. And all of them are based on love. Okay. So what I believe is if we just focus on that portion, you know, the teachings of the love and how we should treat each other and mm -hmm. use it as like a, a stepping stone how to build a good life, you know, if we focused on that part, the world would be a way better place. Absolutely. So I believe that when you get the church involved and, the well, not just the church, you have some pastors, not all. Some pastors are uh, more about greed, the women, and things that they can get out of it. Mm -hmm. So when I start seeing that stuff, I just choose not to. I kind of feel like a lot of the religions are used to start wars. Yeah. You know, in the name of this, in the name of that, I'm able to kill your whole country. You know what I'm saying? So I just, <laughs> I just feel like I never want to be a part of something like that. Yeah. But I know God is real mm -hmm. because I see the flowers and the bees and the beauty in life. I see the sunset. I've been to the ocean and saw it, you know, set over the ocean. So I know someone had to architect, I mean, construct all of that stuff right there. And we couldn't do it, so it has to be a higher being. You know, right. something that connects us. How do you feel about that? Um, I guess being a pastor, talking to someone like me, what would you say? I mean, how could you? I don't really know how to form the question. <laughs> you saying like, what do I think about your beliefs? Yeah, being a pastor means someone like me. You know, we're talking about working together, and um, yeah. I mean, I think it's dope. I think, I think, I think what really caught my attention about you and what you and your wife and organization is doing is that y'all are doing the work. Y'all are not just talking. So it's like you find the common ground. So. In my Bible, it says that undefiled religion is this, that you would help orphans and widows. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what you was telling me yeah. when we was on the phone. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Anybody can, can quote the Bible. You know what I'm saying? Anybody can read a document, memorize it, quote it back to you. But are you applying the principles in that document? Okay. You know, um, I never wanted to be a pastor. Um, I never wanted to preach. My dad was a pastor. Um, even when I joined All About Change, I told my pastor, I said, I'll never be a pastor. I'm seeing what you're going through. And, you know, they say never say never. But then I realized that my calling and purpose with rap is very similar to, to the preaching because when I'm rapping, I'm preaching. You know, my audience is my, my, uh, my, my uh, congregation. Um, you familiar with Pastor Troy? I am. Yeah, so a lot of times when I introduce myself to people when I'm doing music, mm -hmm. I say, have you heard of Pastor Troy? And they be like, yeah. And I say, well, I'm Pastor Jamal. You know what I'm saying? Pastor Troy was actually preaching and quoting scriptures in his music, but he was relating to the thug niggas. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? He was relating to the streets. And a lot of people didn't even realize what he was doing, but they felt it. It resonated with them. And when I was at Georgia Southern, there was a guy, um, you know, hard gangster-like dude, and he had told me, he said, he wanted to commit suicide one day, but mm -hmm. listening to a Pastor Troy song made him not do it. That's deep. Yeah, so sometimes, you know, your best sermon is not even you preaching, bro. You know what I'm saying? It might be mm -hmm. a song. It might be something we're saying in a podcast. You right. know what I'm saying? It might be a conversation. And that's what I'm realizing, that I can get my message out without being part of a church or anything. So I just choose to do it that way. Mm -hmm. I believe tithing is give 10% of my time for the good of, you know, of human beings. Right. Um, <clears throat> I just believe in giving back. Yeah, absolutely. I believe that we can change a lot, you know, coming absolutely. together. And I believe that's why I want to put my hard work and my legacy towards that. Um, I always had this vision. If I could just become president, I can fix all the homeless in, in the United States, right? So I had this crazy idea 
I'm gonna get off the ground one day. So I'm gonna take all the homeless that I run into once I make it big. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna buy a lot of land. I'm gonna build a lot of little houses. Mm-hmm. And then we're gonna farm the rest. I'm gonna have them work the land to first of all feed themselves and for the capital I would take and just keep building on the land. Have like a year or two program mm-hmm. to where they would go through that, have training and stuff, and then they will move on. And in return, they have to come back and help the next group that comes in. Okay. So that's the kind of the stuff that I want to do, man. That's the kind of stuff I feel like God put me here for. I watched yeah. the Panthers. I watched Garvey. I looked at uh, Martin, Malcolm, and I studied these guys. Everybody back to Booker T. And I feel like that's my calling. Like that's how you walk in your God. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You have to stand for something. Yeah, right. And um, I just didn't feel like religion did it for me. But meeting someone like you gave me a different look on it now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I have a different respect for it. You know, I can be myself and still reach. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So that's what makes me want to partner with you. And I think we can make a good change. And and I truly believe that to be effective, you have to be yourself. Mm. Like, I don't think that God can use the fake you. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, the way that you think and your likeness and the way that you speak, God made you that way for a reason. God allowed you to go through stuff for a reason so that you could connect with other people. So... I mean, I believe in being yourself. That's right. Well, so what we're going to do now, we've been talking. He does rap. We're in the studio. So I think we should get him in the booth. What you think about that, Pastor? I think that's great. (laughs) (laughs) All right, cool. We're going to cut. We're going to get to the music. We're going to be back with the interview. God has elevated me on the level so high. I can walk on the roof. I can walk on the slander. I can walk on the surface. I can pray it over your head. I can step on you because you are a cockroach to me. David Ruffin, I am not the one, I'm not the sun, but I'm a sunshine like the sun. I got a gun that'll make every serpent run. Cut your grass, pour your sofa. Watch out for vultures, they ain't have to accept me because I create a cultures. All things to all men, been on all drugs except heroin. You ain't never did nothing, that's why you got no anointing. Join in and lay hands, let's get rid of these demons. I know what they think. Even when they not speaking And I know that they scheming Attack me while I be dreaming But I always defeat them That word in me while I'm sleeping Stunting on you witch You ain't lit like this You better repent For you end up in that I, I enjoy it thoroughly Yeah I enjoy it thoroughly Because you know I I feel like the anomaly And I feel like I am fighting Um uh, Everything that a person believes a pastor is. What do you point that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. I feel like I'm up against every. I'm up against everybody's preconceived notions of what they think a pastor is based on what they've experienced. And and I'm not the first one that's like this. Like my pastor, Pastor Robert Elam, he. <laughs> I mean, he's real. You know, he. Yeah, yeah, sometimes he cuss. He's an ex drug dealer. You know what I'm saying? Got yeah. shot in the head. Got busted with with uh, 17 keys. Like this is a part of his testimony. So I don't. And I think a lot of times people that's really called by God that become pastors went through something. You know, because if you only went to seminary school and then they took you and planted you, something it's just like what is? I mean, if that's what happened, then cool. But what? I mean. You have to have went through something to pull people. And you have to be able to relate to people. And, and everybody's not going to relate to me. You know, it's like going to a buffet. You you get what you want. If you don't like green beans, you don't get the green beans. And that's more the older people are never going to even try to understand it. Yeah. They're just they stuck in their traditional ways. 
come to church, we sing these songs, we got them preach for a minute, you pay the house <laughs> and you go home. They don't want to hear nothing different. Yeah. Last one, man. <laughs> That's what well, they, they said that about Jesus, so. I mean, it is what it, people don't want to change their tradition. Mm -hmm. they, they like to be comfortable. But then, like, I asked this one lady, she visited our church, right, many years ago. A good lady, but stuck in her tradition. She came and she said, oh, your pastor don't preach out the Bible. And then I was like, what you mean he did? He stayed the Bible verse and then he went on to his message. Mm -hmm. And she was like, no, I'm just used to, you know, the whole message being scripture, 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 scripture. I said, so what you used to, right? You know, that tradition, right? Mm -hmm. What has it done for you and your children? She said nothing. So what's the point? So people will fight you to stay in their tradition even when it's not effective. Yeah, they don't even look it up. I think my problem with the older generation, they don't even know why they believe the things that they believe. They were taught that, and they never questioned it. And that was my problem when I was growing up. My grandma was a um, my grandma was a Jehovah Witness, and she used to drag us to church, and I hated it. to the kingdom hall. I hated it. it wasn't no music. It was like, hmm. I'd be like, man, this man, I want out of here. And she used to make us do like Sunday school, Monday, Wednesday. Then we had to go to church on Sunday, so. It made me question a lot. Like, why am I here? Why are you making me do this? You know? Mm -hmm. So, once I got old enough, I got into some trouble when I joined, joined the church. And something just, it didn't sit right with me, so I started researching. So, what I was able to do was, I was able to, what I decided to do was take history and look at history and what was going on at that time because it'll paint a different picture. You're just reading that, what the scriptures are, okay, cool. But what was the law of the land at that time? Exactly. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. I want to know what was the law of the land, and I know that certain words are different. So mm -hmm. when you translate one thing, we could be talking about one thing, but changing that one word can give it a totally different meaning. So I That's want right. to start looking into it that way. And once I went back and started putting the times of... Um, I don't want to get too deep into it because then we'll get into slavery and all that. But uh, King James and how he, you know, the Bible talks about, you know, being that way. But he had a, a, a teenage boyfriend. You know what I'm saying? Then you learn who his auntie was and mm -hmm. his mom. You mm -hmm. learn the story how he became powerful. And then what was his mission once he became powerful? He came to America with those ships. So I had a problem with my Bible being named after him mm -hmm. you see what i'm saying right because it 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 didn't benefit people that look like me right so i kind of feel like it was used against us a lot oh yeah you know absolutely it still recognized. is and still is today right 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 mm -hmm. yeah so that's that's kind of where i started going you know I, I didn't believe in all of that i believe in the principles that the church holds but once you start the building funds, and now I got to have these glass windows, and my church got to be a block long. But you got homeless people sleeping all around that church. You see what I'm saying? You got a big old building that you're going to lock up at nighttime and let these people sleep out here in the cold, but you out here for the people. And then you take the money, and the pastors are millionaires, and they having jets and having nice cars. But the people that give you the money, they all stay in the same position. Mm -hmm. They never grow with you. Mm -hmm. Everybody should be able to come. If I get on the plane, then all you guys who got me there, you loyal followers, should be able to go with Talk me. To me. You see what I'm yeah. saying? So that's kind of what I was thinking at that time at an early age. That's kind of where I strayed away. And a lot of people think like that, and I agree with that. If you, if you are a pastor or anything in leadership, and you're you're uh, you're making great gains off the backs of poor people that are putting their trust in you. No, I ain't with that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, if you get in your money, honestly, like I, like me, I'm a pastor, but I volunteer. I don't get paid. I'm not on the payroll. Yeah. I work at AU Medical Center. I own my own business. Um, prayer creates possibility. Um, entertainment. Uh, I know a bishop right now. He's a pastor, but he owns several businesses. Yeah. You know, he, like me, he does films and has done very well. He writes books and has done very well. So if you're making your money, honestly, you know, 
outside of the church, then that's great. And I do yeah. believe a pastor should be put on the payroll at a certain point when he's giving all his time and energy. Because if he doesn't have any money and he's giving all his time and energy to the people, then, I mean, and he can't feed his own family. That's yeah. crazy. But if you're in it for greed, like I know somebody told me at my job, actually, they said, oh, you're a pastor. Oh, you're going to make a lot of money in that business. I don't see this as a business. You know, I don't see it as a business. Even I do marriage counseling. Even with that, you know, it's not necessarily a business because if God ain't told me to marry you, I'm not fit to marry. Right. You know, that's blood on my hand. You know what I'm saying? So I, I don't do stuff just for money. You know what I'm saying? I work a job, so I don't have to pass it for money. You get what I'm saying? I do. I believe that the pastor should be paid, but it needs to be a negotiated limit then. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, you're not going to get... You got to be church. some type of checks and balances. Yeah, so yeah. like, okay, you shouldn't have to work 40, 50 hours of you to pass and you're looking out for all of us. Okay, right. I agree with that. You should have a decent car. You know, you shouldn't have to struggle. I agree with all of that, but it has to be a cap. You know, you don't need 20 goddamn, what's well, given? You don't need 20 <laughs> houses. <laughs> my bad, man, but, uh, you, don't need 20, <laughs> you don't need 20 rooms in your house. Yeah. You don't need a plane. You don't need 10 cars. Like, it has to be a cap on it because at a certain point, that money has to start going back into that community, though. Yeah, and yeah. when and the thing about it, like I said, it depends where that money is coming from. Cause like I know, I know of another pastor that was on Preachers of Atlanta, and he's a police officer, but he's a pastor. You know what I'm yeah. saying? You got pastors that that I'm not the first one that raps. You got Canton Jones. He sings and raps, but he's a pastor. He has he had he had a radio show. I don't know if he still has it. So like if you're making money from your own businesses, I don't think you should stop business deals because you're a pastor. And I don't think yeah, you should stop pastoring that. because you're making a lot of money. To me, it's all about how did you get the money. So if you if you go into millionaire billionaire status off of your own trade. Then that's one thing. But if you're taking tithes and offering from the people, and then you went and bought a jet with the tithes and offering, and they can't even see the jet, then you know what I'm saying. That's where I look at it, you know. And and another thing that I thank God for that I never was on a payroll, which I'm not opposed to being on one, but I never was on one. Um, I could preach when I want to preach. You get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So I'm not in fear of the congregation leaving because. You ain't giving me no money anyway. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So you can't control me with your giving. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And a lot of pastors are like, oh, I ain't going to touch on that because I'm going to lose. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to lose my support. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I had to worry about that, if I was a pastor, I wouldn't make it. Yeah. I wouldn't because I'd be telling you got people to be the truth. Free. Yeah. And I'd be like, man, look, look, Mitt Jackson, now we all know what you be doing at the church. Sit your head down, Miss Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> you up here jumping around, but we knew what you was doing. Like, stop acting holier than now. You know? Yeah, I don't like. I that. would call people out like I don't that, so like people me. would they wouldn't agree with me. I'd be like, look. Oh, they don't like me. You think it's that? Yeah, they don't, you know they don't like me. Like, sit, go to the back of the church. Yeah, you know, whoever you just talking about, ma'am, you come sit in her spot because you need it. This person, right, obviously don't know why she's here. I would be that kind of person. Like, I'm not gonna sit up here and hold my tongue if I'm the pastor. And I know that we're supposed to be here to love on one another teach one another, help each other grow, and all move in our inner God is what I call it. We all yeah. moving in that. And if you're here judging people, then you're here for the wrong reason. I don't even want to be bothered with you. Right, and if you got time to think about what I'm doing wrong and you're looking at me the whole service, you, what are you doing? You know what I'm saying? Because I don't have time to focus on what's wrong with you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to preach what the word say, and then I'm going to love you. And, and I, got, I got my own demons. You know what I'm saying? I got my own flesh. Yeah. You know, I, I have to repent daily. So if I had, I don't have time to zoom in on all your problems. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. that's and that is what Jesus was about when when they was trying to stone the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. First of all, I'm thinking, well, what about the man? Because she can't commit adultery by herself. And we know that in history, women have been considered the lesser. You know, I've even come to the knowledge that some of these people that were considered men in the Bible were actually women. And they, you know, they, they, they make them masculine because they don't like that. A woman, like some people don't think a woman should preach. I don't agree with that. You know, but uh, Jesus said uh, he without sin cast the first stone. Everybody dropped their stones. You know.
So if I have time to condemn you, because that's not even God's spirit. You know, he, he don't come to condemn you. You know what I'm saying? He convicts, but he's not coming to, to condemn you. You know, where's the love? At? And yes, love is correction, but it's a way to do that. You know, to gently speak to somebody, especially if you're going to take the time to tell somebody what they're doing wrong. It has to be genuine. Yeah. You have to be caring. It can't be, oh, because you, how would you respond if somebody did that to you? I think that you have to go, when you're going to help people, first of all, you can't judge. You have to take yourself completely out of whatever they're telling you. And you need to go in there with 100%, I'm going to gain understanding from whatever was going yes. on. And yes. if I can gain understanding, understanding of why you did it, what made you do it, you know, and let's get to that thought process and let's see where we move from there. And I can't do that by <clears throat> thinking, well, I remember back then I used to, and you should have. Nah, man, you listen to the person you actually take in what they're saying. Yeah. And that's how I would go about it, man. Well, that's, that's how I feel like it should be. Absolutely, yeah. man. And I feel like we all are one. So for me to treat you in any kind of way that I wouldn't want to be treated is selfish, right? Because I have to see myself, even in customer service, I have to see myself as the person on the other side of the phone or the desk or whatever. Like, even when you see people being persecuted and, and, and punished for their crimes, you know, if you kill somebody and then they give you the death, if they give you the death penalty, you know, you don't want to die. You know what I'm saying? But, but some people are so hard to like, well, kill them, you know, behead them, gas chamber, do all. And it's like, but, but if that was you, you would want mercy. So you got to give people the same mercy that you would want because you could find yourself in that same situation. Yeah. Yeah, I had to learn. I, I, I realized I believe in working on self a lot. And I realized that was one of my weak points. You know, I was a terrible listener. You know, <clears throat> so I wanted to work on my communication because I want to help people and I feel like I'm supposed to change lives. But you can't do that being a poor communicator. Yeah. So, you know, I started taking the course NLP um, neuro linguistics programming, yeah. <laughs> so okay. as um, it's kind of teaching me how to do it exactly what I just said. So it's teaching me how to know that my perspective isn't the only perspective. That's you know, right. Your perspective, my perspective, but neither one of them is, is total reality though. It's only our perspective. Yeah, it's our perspective. And once you look at it like that, you're able to have conversations a lot better. You know, take yourself out. So I love it, man. Yeah, I had to learn, and I just can't wait to teach people that shit. I mean, yeah. my best. It's all good. <laughs> hey, this is your show. I'm a yeah. guest, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I just it just respect as far as I being pastor. It. You know, my wife's dad is a pastor, so whenever he come around, Word. yeah, whenever he comes around, he where's is, his church at? Um, he's in. He lives in Stockbridge. Not Stockbridge. No, um, daddy stay in Fairburn, but they they preach at, um, in Carnage at my grandma's house or they'll rotate the church to my aunt's house in yeah. Decatur. So they'll rotate the church. Yeah. Right so it's non-denominational as well. Okay. We have a church in Stockbridge. That's that's near Carnage. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Going okay. back roads is near Carnage. Okay. Maybe we'll check it out one day. We're up there. Okay. We're going to check you out. I really enjoy coming up there. Um, uh, to your church the other day. Appreciate y'all so, pulling up. So I'm gonna be honest with you, right? So yeah. when we get there, we're running late. So when we get there, that's right. Um, we thinking that he's preaching. Uh -huh. And we stand up. You see me grab my jacket, and you come. I was like, so what's going on? He's like, the service about to start, man. We about to bonk out on y'all. <laughs> <laughs> we gonna bonk out. Oh, but but I'm, not, I'm not gonna lie. I don't know the lady's name. Mm. If she's watching, shout see. out the, the the lead singer, the slim lady. Janine. Man, she was amazing. Janine Eason. She yeah. put yeah. so much of her soul into it. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, and yeah. She was so genuinely happy performing them. Oh, yeah. But, but one of my wife and I was talking about that. Is that her original music? No. It's no, not. she's no, she's singing um, praise and worship songs that were okay. written by other artists. No. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to get those songs. And I think I maybe just fell in love with her singing the song. I may not even like the song, you know. Yeah. But she she really she made me feel welcome there. Yeah, you know? and she got a reason to praise God because a lot of people don't understand where that joy comes from, and 
being able to walk with her all these years, I've heard her testimony, you know, yeah. being on pills, being an alcoholic, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Suicide, you know, um, not feeling like there was any more purpose left in her. So when you see her praise, it's coming from a real place. I seen it. Yeah. You know, you can tell her. Yeah. I mean, she, I kept saying, my wife, I said, and she still ain't tired. <laughs> she still ain't tired. Yeah, yeah. She was jumping. And she a little in. something. Man, yeah. She had so much energy, man. It was just a blessing just to watch her. I think she performed four songs, and I think she still could have did four more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure she could have. I'm but, sure uh, she could the have. The way you guys interact was in different. And I actually I actually enjoyed that service of mine. So we'll definitely come back. And my wife tuned in. Hey, Tierra. Where is Tierra? Tierra, the real tour. Yeah, and man, I look at all of you guys ever since we met. We follow you guys, and we feel you know. We take our hats off. We, I think we wake up at the same time. We do we get up at four, five every morning? That right? Yeah. yeah. For everybody yeah, right. out there, so ever since I met this guy, he's been texting me by five o'clock almost every morning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't mind at all. You know, it just it's refreshing. I wake up and be like. And then Pastor Jamal up again. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, Brother Robinson? It's yeah, man. Cool, man. You know, it's pretty cool. Like minded individuals, like I said, you could know the Bible, you could be in church all your life, but what is the work that you're doing? If you die today, what are the lives you've impacted? And when my mom told me what you was doing, then when you told me, then when I came and sat in on y'all meeting, mm -hmm. and just you being willing to even do this, because the same way I could have said, Oh, you don't you don't believe exactly what I believe. You know, you could have said the same thing. It was like, I don't want to deal with you. You know what I'm saying? I didn't, I didn't, I've experienced other pastors. I don't want to deal with you. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So this is already, we already working together. That's right. Yeah, I believe you have to show people that just, you take anything that you can learn from someone. You know, that's what I believe. It's, yeah. So we can sit here and talk. We don't have to have the same belief. Mm -hmm. We can believe two different things. Mm -hmm. And even if you didn't believe in God, I would still sit right here with you and show you the utmost respect. You know, you don't what you believe in don't bother me. Right. But it's something that I can learn from you by sitting yes. down having a conversation. That's the approach I take to everybody that I meet, regardless of what you do. I want to talk to you because I want to learn something from you. We've yeah. been in two different lives. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What your life been like? You know, exactly. what that's what I feel. Yeah. What your life been like? Yeah. So that's kind of how I take that approach. And your wife and I mean, you and your wife remind me of me and my wife with y'all hustle and y'all grind. I've watched a lot of y'all videos outside watch y'all movie, which I love, by the way. I appreciate Shout it. Shout out to the cast. You know, I saw you guys in church. I love the movie. Um, the music videos, you rap, she rap. She's doing her business, you doing your thing. You know, and I follow off that, and I just admire it, man, from afar. Like, I really, really respect what you guys are doing. I you appreciate know? it, JR. So, um, that's kind of maybe to you. I appreciate it, man. Thank you, guys. And I'm, and I'm always open-minded because my thing is if you cannot challenge what you believe, then, then perhaps you shouldn't believe it, right? Mm. I mean, if we don't ask the questions, how will we get the answers? Oh, yeah. And, uh, like, in college, one of my best friends was agnostic. I don't know if you know what that means, but it's like I don't, I don't say that God exists, but I don't say that he doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But she was... She was the first one to get the PCP tag. Like, there's a PCP tag. I won't take my clothes off, but I got it right here. Right. My wife has it, like, right here. Um, sh the girl I'm talking about that was agnostic, she got it on her on her finger. Okay. She was the very first one to ever get it. And she didn't even believe in God, but she believed in me. And we had a great friendship, you know what I'm saying, loyalty. Mm -hmm. And that's my thing is, can you be loyal? Can you be genuine? Uh, can we build something? Because at the end of the day, I can't make you believe what I believe. That's right. But we can be cordial and respectful to one another. And like you just said, I can learn something from you. I can learn something from her and vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, some of my greatest supporters are people that don't believe like me. You know? Right. Yeah, man. I just, <clears throat> I just try to look at people for who they really are. Look at their actions. You know? I don't really get into what they believe. Yeah, yeah, the actions are everything, bro. Yeah, the actions are it. everything. It is. And that's, I'm so focused on what I got going. Either I don't have do time. Else, yeah. Or we can't. You know, we yeah. can call you when I see you, but. Yeah. I ain't got time. Yeah, I ain't got nothing. I ain't got no time for that. Hey, for the people, one time. I don't know if anybody can see it. Show your shirt. Oh, that's another oh. thing that I like right here. Right? Yeah, it's talk. Yeah. 
Talk to me. Walk with me. Pastor Jamal. Pastor Jamal. Yeah. Say it one time like you do in a video call. Talk to me. Walk with me. <laughs> <laughs> I like yeah. it. Yeah. I ain't gonna lie. I smile so hard every time you do it. And I remember you left a voice, man. You was laughing. I, I was busting out laughing. <laughs> so it caught me off guard, right? So I'm calling you for the first time. I think when you call, I was busy. So I'm calling you. You were asleep. Here. And then when I call back, I get your voicemail. So I'm expecting the pastor. And then you come with that, and I'm dying laughing in the background. Talk to me. Walk <laughs> with me. And I was like, what the? And I'm dying laughing. Really yeah. Well. yeah. Yeah. That intrigued me right there. I just couldn't wait to talk to you after that. Yeah. Get the shirt, <laughs> get the hoodie, the mask, the underwear, the shoes, all that. Make sure I put a link. Yeah. We put a link. Make sure we support, man. That's one thing that. we want to make sure we do. We always try to support the local black businesses. Anybody who's trying to do something positive, make sure we support 100%. Yes, right. That's how we grow. On the way we're going to build Black Wall Street, we all do it together. That's right. You know what I'm saying? That's what yeah, I really believe. Stop all this hate. We got to do it together, yeah. man. It's the only way we can do it. We need nurses and doctors. We need educators. We need financial advisors. We yes, need we all of that like to come Chinese. together and be like, look, forget who's going to leave. Somebody's going to leave. That person's going to just stand out. Mm -hmm. I don't think we got to worry about building infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Let's build that infrastructure, and that's the church I want. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I want my church to be the whole village. I don't care. We out there talking. So I got this thing I want to do with, like, business. I mean, we used to cook out and drink and smoke and chill a lot. So I want to take that same concept, and well, nobody touch nothing until everybody come up with their business ideas they had for that week or two. You know, meet every, like, two weeks. And instead of just sitting down and playing dominoes and cards, let's talk about business ideas. Let's talk about the ideas you have to help the community. Let's talk about the ideas you have to just help yourself, mm -hmm. you know, your family. And then if we all came together and did that a lot more, can you imagine what we'd be as a people? You know, that's the kind of stuff that I'm on, man. Mm -hmm. I want to build. I feel like I could be a guard. I could be an ex, you know. That's right. I feel like that in my mind. <clears throat> and eventually I'm going to run into the people I need to to help that come true. And we're going to change stuff. You know? I want right. to have food programs. Yes, sir. You know, like, when you study the Panthers, they try to push that military stuff. You know, they walked around with guns, they were militant. But if you look at what they really built themselves off of, off of it was helping the community. It was all love. You know what I'm saying? When they came out there, <clears throat> they started feeding the kids, and then they implemented things like free health care, free ambulance rides, free pest control. You know, they had a whole 10-point system that they did. And I studied things like that, and I tried to figure out, how did they get all these people to follow them, though? You know, to believe in what they were saying. So that's why I studied them, and I feel like I almost got that thing figured out. Mm -hmm. We get that thing implemented, man, we can really make some good change. Mm -hmm. And that's what I propose, man. Every time I meet somebody, I'm like, man, I feel like we can change the world. We can. You know, we can. We change, the, can. World. We can change yeah. the world, but it has to be all of us. And, yeah. That we French. We we French. We, we, <laughs> we French. We are. <laughs> I know. I stay on my toes. Yeah. But um, that's what I believe, man. <laughs> we all had that mindset of, okay, take care of yourself. Take care of your family. But that 10% and tithing that we talk about, the church believes one way. We took that 10% and put it just towards each other. And also, if you're going to take 10% <clears throat> of your money, let's just say, I got this idea from Dr. Umar Johnson, if anybody ever, you know, researched him. Yeah, I'm he, familiar. So he had this idea <clears throat> I thought was amazing. If we, um, <laughs> if we, as a black community, right, let's just say we all eat a lot of grits. Mm -hmm. If we just took our grit money every week That's and right. kind of like put it together, That's right. ain't nobody eating no damn grit. You know what I'm saying? So we ain't nobody eats. We're going to take that money. We're going to pile it up until we get to this. And then we're going to open our school. It only take a couple months. You know what I'm saying? We get everybody in this city to come together and be like, you know what? We want our own school. How do we go about it? We figure out some kind of fund to where can't nobody touch it. You know, it's to the public. Everybody can see it. Yes. A couple of months, we got that thing. Mm -hmm. And then we're on to the next project. And it really ain't hurting nobody. It just costing you your grit money or your hair grease money because I think if you just look at the numbers we spend on just hair products a mm -hmm. year, you know, the female with all that weed. Oh, they're going to spend. If they they're just took yeah. a third of that hair money that y'all be spending and just invested that into the community, 
instead of giving it to the church, if we implemented something like that, man, the change will come. It will start city citywide, and that thing will grow statewide and nationwide. It will be all over the world because then we'll realize we would be showing people if we could just do it ourselves. We don't need the government. We don't need a and system. I, and and I believe that at at one time the church was the government. Yeah. Yeah, yes, because. Because if you if you look at it, and then from okay from a biblical standpoint, I really don't identify as a Christian. I identify as a kingdom ambassador. When Jesus when Jesus taught and preached, he preached repent for the kingdom is at hand. The reason why they crucified him is because he what well, they said he was claiming to be the king of the Jews. Mm -hmm. So they like wait a minute, you're saying you're the king, you know? But he wasn't saying the king of this world. He was talking about the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So as a kingdom ambassador. The church is supposed to be an uh, in, uh, uh, education institution as well as a kingdom embassy, right? To represent the government of the kingdom of God. So back when we were closer to, uh, well, during segregation and all that, I feel like black people come together when we go through hell. Yeah. But then when we start getting it easy and a few of us become millionaires, billionaires, and we balling and we think that we free, like but this. really we still mentally locked yeah. up, right? Because yeah. we still hating on each other. We still cheating on each other. We still taking each other's wives and husbands. We still jealous of each other and envying one another. Right. But it's like when we go through suffering, we hit our knees, we come together. Like, you know, people say that their atheist is agnostic, but I guarantee you on September 11th, you know, the church was packed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I bet if a nuclear bomb hit tonight, God forbid, you know, people will be running trying to find a church or, or, or at least, you know, on their knees praying. And it's like when we that's why suffering can be good sometimes. You know, it's a verse I live by. It's good that I was afflicted that I might learn your statutes because it's been through my pain that I've gotten stronger, mm -hmm. that I've gotten wiser and that because that, I had COVID. You know what I'm saying? Right. And um you know, shout out to Cozy or whatever. Um, and maybe just be a flu and they doing all that over there. Gotta be careful about what you say on these platforms. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I had COVID. It made me more grateful. I actually preached a message. Then I was asked to speak at my job about my experience with COVID. And super more humble, super more grateful, super more excited. You know, never thought I'd be so grateful to be able to taste and smell. You know what I'm saying? Never thought I'd be so grateful to be able to breathe without coughing every five seconds and having mucus, you know, so thick in my, my lungs. And through that experience, it made me so much more grateful. And it's like sometimes we have to go through suffering so that we can realize what's truly important. And I know in the black community, it's like we don't really come together until we go through hell. So you got to think like slavery. I feel like when we was in slavery, we was the most powerful. Yeah. You know, we were speaking in code. We, we, we had secret... Um, ways and routes to get to what we thought was freedom. And I say that for a reason. You know, uh, we was willing to die behind what we believed. Now, you know, you 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 settling to go get you a new booty, new lips, you know what I'm saying? You're not happy with the way that you look. You know what I'm saying? You seek validation in men and women. And it's like, do you know who your grandma is? grandma was do you do you know what they had to go through just for you to sit here today yeah. and and you settle for 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 something that doesn't even have value you know what i'm saying it's it's really ridiculous and like you was talking about history knowing your history if we really thought about what our ancestors went through we are our ancestors wildest dreams mm -hmm. you know but what are we doing what are we doing with this time what are we doing with this opportunity and it's like when we was going through segregation, trying to get rights, and they telling you, judge how many Skittles in the jar and all that stuff, that stuff brought strength. You know, we was praying. We was meeting at church, not just to hear the Bible. We was meeting at church to decide what move we going to make to shift, you know, the way that these people are seeing us. What moves are we going to And see, a lot of people get on Martin Luther King talking about, you know, the, the color it's not about the color of your skin, but the content of the, the character and, you know, the content mm -hmm. of your heart. But they don't talk about when he was talking about financial increase. And then that's when he died. That's when he got him killed. That's what got him killed. It's okay. We'll segregate. We'll segregate. Mm -hmm. um, we'll assimilate. Mm -hmm. You know, y'all coming together. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But we don't want y'all to have no money. We don't want you to own nothing. We don't want you to have property. Yeah. We don't want you to know what the, what the laws are. Even with this bag. Even with this thing. 
You know, there's yeah. rights that you have that, you know, they. that's why they just made a motion to suspend that so-called mandate because they, we have civil rights, civil rights, Title um, seven. you yeah. know. Um, you cannot force people to have these intrusions. Yeah. Um, and so many people stepped into court, you know, black and white, you know, Native American, all. And it's like, we were not doing this even at my job. Many doctors, nurses, don't want anybody. You, you cannot force this. Um, and everybody yeah. don't need their job. No. Um, you know. I, speaking of the, the jab, um, I don't, <laughs> we don't believe Talk it. to me. New jab. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we don't believe in it, man. I, 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 I encourage our people to really do the research, and I look at it as chemical warfare. You know, <clears throat> I think that we're kind of being attacked by certain stuff. So the reason I believe that if you go do your research, what did they do to the Indians? <clears throat> you know, after they killed a lot of them off, they gave them blankets with smallpox, right? Mm -hmm. Then look at Tuskegee. You know, and I can just keep going yeah, I on. I saw that movie. You know, if you look at kind of how they've been doing us, sometimes they use certain stuff against us to help try to kill us off. Nothing's worked so far. But if you do the proper research, then, you know, I don't knock anybody who takes it and I don't want to, you know, come off like that. And I but, don't either. Yeah, but if you do the research, it's been used against us so much. How can you trust it? You know what I'm saying? Like we are chemical, not chemically, our DNA is different. It's not the same. So they may give us stuff and a lot of them could survive, but it could affect us differently. You know? And when you look at stuff yeah. like that, I just, I can't believe in it. You yeah. know? I'd rather go down in flames before I take it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's just kind of how I And my it. thing is this. So I'm not against vaccines. I'm against control. Mm -hmm. Anything that is good should not have to be forced. I've never in my life, and I'm 32, I've never in my life ever seen something promoted so heavy. No. You know. You're right. You 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 don't have to promote water. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We know that you need H2O. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to promote that you need to eat. We know we, you need to eat, you know. After 40 days of not eating, that's starvation. So it's like, if something is good, and this is anything, if something is good for me, it should not be forced upon me. So you have to question that. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm not against... Um, you protecting yourself, bettering your health. But once you take my choice out of the matter, we say my body, my choice. Okay, what, what happened today? Talk to me. Guess that only, you know what I'm saying? I guess that only applies when you talk about women. <laughs> my body, my choice, I guess. I guess it don't apply to all of us, but I just I think it's crazy, man. And I think that people are just used to being told what to do. They're comfortable with it. Yeah, your freedom is an illusion. Like, I'm really excited to watch this uh, new Matrix that's coming out. I'm really excited to see. That's a new Matrix movie? Mm-hmm, the Matrix 4, um, to see Red Pill, Blue Pill. I'm, I'm eager to see what kind of metaphors they're going to be dropping because those producers and directors, they were so ahead of the game when they dropped. Let me tell you, speak. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Check this, it's going to blow your mind. So, I'm watching the producer... Uh, was the producer, the director of director. the director? One that wrote. Uh, who? Okay. Did you know that the Terminator and the Matrix is the the Matrix is a sequel to the Terminator, and so the Terminator, the lady Connor, the the guy in the Matrix is supposed to be her kid in the future, and they're trying to come to the future to mm -hmm. kill him. Mm -hmm. I didn't. It blew my mind. I was like, well, but when why? you think about it, that makes sense because they were fighting the machines. Mm -hmm. in the matrix mm -hmm. so then this is what i thought and this is just trippy and i was telling tiara what if in this matrix because you know they got out of the matrix mm -hmm. a lot of people got out of that programming so what if now that they're out they're in this world and 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 the people that we're fighting are the robots and we don't even know it because in the terminator the terminator looked like us on the outside right I don't know how how uh, deep y'all are into believing sh about shape shape shifters, the, shape the reptilian community. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, how in the hell are my you? back? Cause y'all been talking to me. We ain't recording. We y'all supposed to be going in the uh, booth. You're not recording. Oh well, I've been recording since you got here. Yeah, this I'm, is my and phone. I'm on live. Well, then stop talking to me. You've been. 
You been asking me questions. Well, they do. I just been, been in and out. They should why? Been in and out. She like an executive producer of the show. She is the executive producer. They can do that. <laughs> she can do that. <laughs> they do what she wants. Right. Like now I've got questions. Just y'all. Damn it. But yeah, like, what if that's what it is, though? You know what I'm saying? And then I always was told that if it's in a movie, they they either have already did it or they're doing it. So, I don't mean to cut you, but I want you to go back and find the interview she did. It has a lot of biblical stuff in there that she tied into those two movies. Okay. So, it was kind of like... You did. Came, no, the, the, the director, oh, the director okay. put that into the movie. Did. So it's a lot of biblical stuff that she put in there, but you have to listen to her in the interview, and I'm going to find it tomorrow and send it to you. Okay, she man. breaks that down. It's going to be mind-blowing. Okay, man. It's going to be mind-blowing to you, man. <laughs> to your <era> laugh. <laughs> yeah, and then, like, even what you said when we had that meeting about the missing bus in the Bible, it's a lot of screwed-up stuff that has taken place man. that they don't want you to know because if you know it, then you will know they are among us. Okay. You got a second? Yeah, I got time. We got time. So I got time. I want you to come talk to me. Walk with me through this door, right? I got you. I, I tried it. I tried it. <laughs> he did. He did. I tried it. I tried it. Yeah. So, in the book of Enoch. That's, that's right. Book, that's what we're speaking about. So, they talk about a lot of, um, so, for those who don't know, Enoch was one of the only humans to go to heaven meet God, <clears throat> he was allowed to come back, but he went, met God, wrote a book word for word with God. God allowed him to come back, bring the book to his children, say his goodbyes, and then took him back. So in that book, he takes him on a trip and explains, I think, the seven heavens. And he also it, you know, takes him around the world and show him how the moon, the sun works. But I'm going to fast forward because this is the interesting part to me. Mm-hmm. He he was speaking about the fallen angels, the Nephilim. The ne- yeah. He was speaking about the them and what they came, how they slept with a woman, had the baby, and what they taught the magic and um, That's right. war and all of that That's stuff. Right. Okay, so we get to that. He shows and he, he explains in that book where the fallen angels are being held captive. Okay. All right. Cool. Now let's come to reality because I told you I like to do a lot of. Uh, history and comparing stuff, mm-hmm. right? So it's this story. <clears throat> it's a guy named Richard Admiral Burton. Alright? So you guys can look this up. So, Richard Admiral Bird was the guy who won the race to the North Pole. Okay? So, he won the race to the North Pole, and then once he came back, he was celebrated. He wanted another adventure. He went to the South Pole, right? So, this was 50s, 60s. Uh, when you look it up, 50s, 60s. So, his next adventure was going to be to the South Pole, right? So, he gets down there and they run into this 200-foot wall of ice. Straight up. They can't get by it. They ain't really got the technology at the point. So, they travel trying to find an opening. It wasn't one. So, then they come. They regroup. They go back down. And this one is called Operation High Jump. So, Operation High Jump was pretty much trying to get over this 200-foot wall. Right? And so... I'm going to try to make this short because it's kind of long. So they get down there to go down a couple times. So when they get down there and they finally get up there, he comes back and do an interview. And he's saying, we found untouched land the size of the Americas, right? Untouched, full of natural resources to hold us over for lifetimes and lifetimes. His fear was the world was probably going to be at war trying to get a hold to whatever was down there, right? So they go down afterwards. And when they go down, they come back, and everything's changed. They ran, I believe they ran into something, right? And if you look up Richard Adam Burr in his diaries, right before he died, he spoke of things called hollow earth. And he said when they went down, they ran into something more intelligent, right? They tried to say that he went crazy. But I say all of that to say, if you really read the book of Enoch, and you listen to that story right there, and... Kind of look at how things shaped afterwards for us in society, right? So let me give you an example. NASA was created after that. Did you know who the top scientist was in NASA? It was Hitler's top scientist. So they took the German scientists and made them 
the top people in NASA. And they started shooting missiles straight up, and they call it Operation Fishbowl, if you want to look that up. Operation Fishbowl, so they start shooting nuclear weapons straight up. So what my belief is, they ran into something that was more intelligent down there. So what they did when they came back, they did a 100-year treaty. All of the nations, nobody can go down to Antarctica. Only the most powerful people in the world can go, right? So like uh, the Cheneys, the Obamas, the Bushes, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I forget what two churches, they ain't speaking a hundred years, but when they finally decided, I think it was the Romans and whatever other church. Yeah, it's when, not about right. When they came the back together, in the earth. they went to meet down there. Mm -hmm. So if you think about technology before the 50s, 60s, all the way back to the king days, it was kind of limited technology, you know what I'm saying? We were just getting the motor car and all of that stuff. Now think about technology after we went down there. You know what I'm saying? From the 50s until now. Look at technology jump. I believe they ran into something down there. You know? The fallen angels. If you, lit, if you read the book of Enoch and he give you the description of where they being held, what did they run down there that was more intelligent? Now, it may sound all crazy, but no, 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 these, no. these are all facts. Check you know this out. Talking? Remember when I said, I was told, and y'all probably heard this before, if they did a movie on it, they either already did it or it's being done, right? All right. So have you seen Transformers? Yeah. Yeah. That a is. level of intelligence beyond human thinking, right? Yeah. And they actually aren't robots. They're aliens. That's just... How they're structured. Mm -hmm. What did they call the Decepticon? The Fallen. Yeah. The Fallen what? Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. And then they was down there in Antarctica or something like that. I remember yeah. one movie they was under snow, found some undiscovered. Mm -hmm. And their technology was, was way out of here. And then they were dealing with the wealthiest people on the planet. But they were really being influenced by the Decepticons. A lot of strong metaphors. Yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. trying to tell us something. That's deep. And some deep even research. believe that these people have to, like, that's their code. They have to tell us in some form or fashion what they're doing so that when it comes to the light, you know, they say, well, we told you so. Mm -hmm. We prepared you for this when we when we drop an alien out here for everyone to see. We've been showing y'all in these movies mm -hmm. in these books. Yeah. Make sure to get it in, y'all. Get in the booth. Your host, J.R. King. Y'all tune in to their uh, YouTube <laughs> channel and everything they podcast. Um, <laughs> David Ruffin, I am not the one, I'm not the sun, but I'm a sunshine like the sun. I got a gun that'll make every serpent run. Cut your grass, pour your sofa. Watch out for vultures, they ain't have to accept me because I create a culture. All things to all men, been on all drugs except heroin. You ain't never did nothing, that's why you got no anointing. Join in and lay hands, let's get rid of these demons. I know what they think. Even when they not speaking And I know that they scheming Attack me while I be dreaming 